good afternoon and thank you so much for coming. And I apologize, there was a small misunderstanding about this lecture this morning, but I, I'm so happy that this could be organized for noon. And thank you again for coming. So Lisa Arisa does not really require an introduction, but I'll do it in any way. So she's a very well-known anterior segment surgeon, and she's now uh, retired from her private practice, but she's still very active in research and giving ideas, and we are very happy that she's an adjunct faculty here at the Moran. So she's going to present something that's very interesting and important for us because she came um, this weekend to work with us in the lab this afternoon in a related subject. So this is going to be a perfect background for that. Thank you very much, Lisa. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you so much to Elaine and others for making this uh, come to fruition today. Um, it's been such a pleasure to be associated uh, with you. The last uh, important labs that Liliana and I did together became the nidus of uh, my talks on uh, complication management and avoidance. And uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you about a new subject here, very, uh, which I think is very, very important and to me will be the future of medicine. I have disclosures. I am a consultant to Minosis, which will be uh, important to this talk. Uh, the Smart Vision Lab is irrelevant to the talk. I'm going to try to convince you to abandon the bag. I'll introduce my new surgical technique of scleral bicapsulotomy capture that I'm calling SBCC. And to my knowledge, uh, no one has ever recommended this uh, as any routine procedure. And I'll explain how I came to it and uh, why I'm working to see if this is the right way to go. Keep in mind, being a great surgeon isn't just acquiring skills and having good hands, but it's also having good judgment to know when not to jump on a bandwagon and neither to eat its dust. Now, as you know, uh, when we operate, there's a breakdown of the blood aqueous barrier and uh, healing response that involves the lens epithelial cells with proliferation, which is what we're mainly concerned with because we just take for granted the transformation. Proliferation, of course, leads to Elschnick's pearls and the typical PCO that we use YAG lasers for. Uh, and then there can be fibroblasts and myoblasts that occur that actually lead to the opacities and rigidities and the wrinkles and contractions traction that we see that we have uh, often thought there's not much to do about. And we're used to seeing these things over time and of course this is the phimosis that often leads to bag lens subluxation and needs early treatment and uh, uh, by and large it's uh, thought that this is a normal perfect eye. This eye is 20-20 and although maybe they could have blown away that fl floater for them, whenever we do a YAG laser for secondary cataract, which as you know uh, would be 100% in children if we didn't do anterior vitrectomy and vitrector rexus, uh, but a good 20 to 30% arguably probably more if people live long enough and as we do earlier surgery we'll find this out uh, so many people undergo PCO and need a YAG laser which is thought to be kind of very benign because it's quick and easy and painless but on the other hand we do always or virtually always break the anterior hyloid which is actually our protection between the posterior segment and the anterior segment which protects the macula and uh, the retina now I'm going to try to convince you, regardless of whether you're interested in these future concepts, uh, to master the posterior capsulorexis. And uh, there are various reasons to do that, in order to reduce PCO, obviously, uh, but to convert an unstable accidental tear into a continuous tear that allows us to continue to bag and plant. It's a very important skill. Uh, because a tear will, that isn't finishing outside of where it began with any force can tear out uh, to allow the immediate visual rehabilitation uh, in unpolishable plaques. You know, we, have, we usually wait till the blood retinal barrier is restored at six weeks to three months. Usually patients have to wait three months since that's the global period for payment before going ahead with a YAG laser. And, um, and they have to uh, suffer a decreased vision in the interim. Uh, and uh, when general anesthesia is required for people who can't sit for a YAG, uh, mentally handicapped people or physically uh, distorted bodies that won't fit 
into the YAG laser. And then I think it's an important technique which people don't keep in mind nearly enough for optic capture for subluxated lenses. If we have a membrane or a posterior capsule or an anterior capsule that can be converted in some way to a large enough continuous opening to be able to uh, optic capture, then we don't need to suture to the iris, which usually leads to some low-grade chronic inflammation, and we don't have to do a major vitrectomy in order to scleral fixate. Now here's an example of uh, a patient, uh, a case where, um, and I turned them all down, so sorry about that, I'll just have to do it again. I saved it and everything, but at any rate, um, um, I'm happy to give this uh, uh, to you, these videos. I can also substitute with the voiceover uh, or if you'd like them later. Uh, and it's a routine case. I always support the anterior chamber when removing the INA and I saw a clear area here. And I'm exploring it by putting OVD through that apparent hole which obviously is a hole because you can see the viscote just fall down into the vitreous. If you had 3D you know, through the microscope it'd be very obvious. So I'm quickly uh, putting more OVD into the sulcus and I'm taking a little edge. Sometimes you need to, to use a, uh, a vanus to make an edge, although that's rare. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm going to convert this small tear, as round as it looks, it will not hold up to forces, to a true continuous curvilinear capsularexis. And uh, we can do that nicely. Uh, if there's already vitreous prolapse through there, then we have to deal with that vitreous first, preferably with irrigation anterior and a pars plana approach to bring the vitreous home and not enlarge the opening. And there are many videos on that. It's a course that I teach at many, um, many of the meetings. And uh, actually, Abbe Vasavada has one of the nicest uh, uh, videos through ASCRS showing how important it is to consider learning to do a proper pars plana approach. At any rate, here we are. It's not really rocket science, though you see that the forces have to be more centripetal because the anterior capsule is about 14 to 16 microns thick and the posterior capsule is in the range of 5 microns of thickness. And of course behind that is the anterior hyloid like the yolk of a, like the membrane on a yolk from egg. Uh, very fragile. And there is a space delimited by Weigert's ligament, uh, the posterior zonules all around called Berger space between the anterior hyloid and the posterior capsule. And uh, so you can see we were able to save the day and place our one-piece uh, um, uh, uh, toric lens in the bag and rotate it properly. And then you just have to be sure that you don't allow the chamber to collapse and that you keep it uh, down as a nice barrier to keep the hyloid from breaking when you finish, which is why I use the acetylcholine that you might have seen uh, bring the pupil down. <clears throat> now here's an example of a obviously very mature cataract. And uh, using tripan, uh, we've made a nice anterior capsularexis. I have another whole lecture. I'd love to talk to you sometime for an hour about uh, my uh, uh, circumferential cross-action chop disassembly technique for very brunescent lenses, uh, such as this. This is that, that tan, gooey, brunescent variety, but they get black as well. And sometimes the tan ones are even more leathery and more difficult. Um, and uh, we won't uh, concentrate on that, but what you'll see here is that once I've completed the uh, FACO, and of course there's uh, even a calcific uh, rim at the periphery, and once we've completed that nicely, I'm using my Terry Squeegee, and you can see that this plaque absolutely uh, will not polish off. And I feel that it's uh, the bag is very uh, 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 was very extended, extensible. So I've added a CTR to make it a little more taut in order to make it practical to be able to do the posterior capsularexis. And I'm putting OVD into the sulcus just to flatten the anterior and posterior uh, leaves. I left this bubble in because you don't want a bubble in your you know in your uh, uh, syringe when you do this ideally. And the idea is to take a 30 gauge uh, bevel up needle, not a cystitome which could poke down enough in order to break the hyaloid, but rather lift it off, make a little tear, uh, and then put the OVD through to define burger space. And in this case, because of the fibrosis, we uh, go two directions. And I decide not to optic capture, which I'll talk about later in this case, because of the fibrosis and not being absolutely certain of the perfect um, continuousness of this uh, particular rexus in this case. 
case. But a patient like this, instead of seeing 2050 or 2060 for three months, will be 2020 on day one. And uh, so we've saved them the early YAG laser capsulotomy and all of the potential consequences of that, which as you know, include particularly in myopes, the increased risk of retinal terror detachment and possibly CME. And in diabetic retinopathy, we allow all of our compounds to move forward and back. And in glaucoma, uh, there's some good evidence that it's the vitriol elements uh, that uh, are toxic to the t uh, trabeculum that increases the pressure sometimes, not just as a pressure spike, but actually uh, a long term after YAG laser in glaucoma patients. So uh, we've managed to complete this, and then we're going to blow up the spare tire, basically, which is the bag, because now we have a posterior rexus and an anterior rexus, blow up the uh, spare tire, the sulcus with OVD, so that we can implant a lens. And we could optic capture a one-piece into burger space. That's posterior optic capture. But three pieces are better when we intend to optic capture, and certainly critical if we're going to put it in the sulcus and optic capture through the anterior capsule, since we never want a one-piece lens in the sulcus. Uh, and you can see that this ends up very uh, lovely. We've supported the chamber, and uh, this patient can be 20-20 the next day. Now there's lots of literature about posterior optic capture, and um, uh, it goes back to probably 1996 when Gimbel first described this. Uh, certainly Tassignon and Menopachi are two of the biggest proponents of posterior capsulorexis with uh, what he calls, uh, uh, Menopachi calls posterior buttonholing. Uh, and uh, perhaps we would add, what would you say, De Groot and uh, Neuhan perhaps to this list, but these are uh, the big uh, uh, relevant uh, articles. And, uh, um, basically, the question is, why should we do that? What if we just do a posterior capsulorexis? Will it always avoid uh, visual axis obscuration? Absolutely not. In children, we still have a very high percentage because of the uh, vitreous being um, uh, pretty solid and the uh, anterior hyloid gives a scaffolding for it to grow over. And in adults, it even may be 2 to 7% of PCO despite uh, posterior capsule, uh, capsulorexis itself. This is a very nice uh, picture that actually shows burger space between the anterior hyloid and the posterior capsule. It's Manapachi's picture. And um, uh, we have a, an earlier history, a different way of doing this, but uh, Dr. Stegman uh, in South Africa, who uh, mainly does a lot of pediatric trauma, has just done slit capsulotomies and then optic captured. But that means you've got to be really careful not to place any forces on that that might cause it to wrap around. And we don't really consider that sufficiently stable, though he has quite a bit of literature showing that 5 to 12 years out, it's both stable and has a clear visual axis. Still, I think we should strive for continuous rexus if we're looking to have all surgeons of all capacities and abilities uh, to do a technique. Uh, now here is a case uh, that I've done, and uh, uh, you'll suffer through for four minutes, a uh, pediatric case always. Uh, I don't like to use uh, Tripan Blue for the anterior capsule in pediatric cases, although it does make it less elastic and a little easier to deal with. It does make a permanent molecular change, and who knows that what that'll mean 50, 60 years from now. Uh, so I think it's quite possible to do a decent uh, capsulorexis, anterior capsulorexis without. And I'll take time to measure, because anytime I'm going to deal with the posterior capsule, it's really important that you have a well-sized and reasonably centered anterior capsulotomy since that's our backdoor option. Should we have a complication in doing our posterior capsulorexis, we can always sulcus implant an anterior optic capture. And uh, so that's why I wouldn't attempt a posterior rexus in most cases if I don't have an appropriate anterior capsulorexis. The posterior capsulorexis can be quite forgiving in terms of its size and its, uh, and its centration because when you place a lens in the bag, or the sulcus for that matter, an optic capture posteriorly into burger space, it's not the capsulorexis that's centering the lens, it's the haptics that are sitting in the bag or the sulcus that are centering that lens, and so it can be fairly forgiving, but you can't make it too small or it's possible to break it. So here, and I'm a little slow, Dr. Menapachi feels that it's a 150 case learning curve to be really facile at doing a posterior capsulorexis. I made it up to 80. I did uh, all of our pediatric cataracts, which weren't that many. Uh, my husband's a pediatric uh, ophthalmologist, and we thought we were the ideal team where I worked as his technician. He actually, you know, followed the patient, decided when and if 
they needed surgery and then followed them immediately afterwards. And even the newer pediatric ophthalmologist who joined our group uh, asked me to do anyone that needed an implant because these eyes are so quiet as opposed to doing an anterior vitrectomy or leaving them aphagic. You know, the uh, recent infant aphagia study uh, involved posterior uh, vitreorexis and uh, an anterior vitrectomy, uh, capsulorexis and, and uh, anterior vitrectomy and with or without an implant. <clears throat> and they found that they had similar ultimate visual outcomes but more interventions with the ones with implants at early ages because of fibrosis and subluxation and inflammation and problems. Um, <clears throat> but all pediatric cataracts have uh, something like, or congenital cataracts, have something like a 15 to 20 percent risk of consecutive open angle glaucoma, which is the truly, uh, once we get over amblyopia, the truly uh, vision threatening problem. And Stegman at least believes, as do I, that it's because we do something routinely in children that's considered a complication in adults, and that is an anterior vitrectomy, and that allowing those vitreal elements access to the immature trabeculum makes for that high rate of glaucoma. Now, if some of these eyes may have just immature trabeculum, I'm not including uh, anterior segment dysmorphic angles. I'm talking about normal looking eyes with just congenital cataracts. So uh, posterior optic capture, and here what you're seeing is that I'm pushing the, the poles of the optic having completed the capsulorexis, filling burger space through the small opening, and I'm pushing on the poles 90 degrees apart. Uh, 90 degrees away from the optic haptic junction in order to capture the optic into burger space below the posterior capsule. And you'll see in a moment I, I'm uh, uh, doing lots of irrigation so that when I come out it won't collapse. And uh, I'll just, uh, any, uh, by the way, any OVD, viscoelastic, that's left behind the implant with an open posterior capsule will not cause capsular distension syndrome nor will it cause a pressure rise because it doesn't have access if you're hermetically sealing it into the posterior segment, it doesn't have access to the trabeculum. So of course you're still going to remove any OVD, and I wanted to stop it here so you could really see uh, just a little bit different than that. Um, so you can really see the capture. And you can see here the cat eye appearance of the posterior capsulotomy from a haptic uh, optic junction to optic junction, and then the intact capsulorexis, which is undisturbed and uh, round here that you can just barely see. And that's what we're looking for for posterior optic buttonhole. And when we do this, we find that the eyes are exceedingly quiet, that the visual axis remains clear uh, throughout life, actually. Now, here is a beautiful um, uh, video from Marie Jose uh, Tassignon in Brussels. And it's intraoperative OCT. So you're going to watch as she uh, violates the posterior capsule here. Here's the anterior hyloid. And you'll watch as she goes and makes that, oh, that stab opening and pulls it around to make a little, uh, a little curvilinear uh, tag, and then takes the OVD and uh, puts it through the opening to push back, and you see how burgers came, I mean how anterior hyloid came forward. But now she's got this little, this little cannula, and you see how she's pushing it backwards out of the way, so that you end up with a fairly, and you can barely see the hyloid here, <clears throat> but you end up pushing the hyloid back with your OVD, making a nice bubble of OVD, and you have a fairly um, uh, uh, con convex, posterior capsule, and now she's going to grab the capsule, <clears throat> and she's going to make this continuous circular curvilinear posterior capsulorexis, and uh, you can watch that happen on OCT, and she is probably one of the world's masters at this, uh, uh, especially in pediatric cases, and her goal is to make the anterior and the posterior capsulorexis both perfectly centered, perfectly sized, and symmetric, because she has a lens called the bag in the, le in the lens, uh, which is not FDA approved, and something that I found very fascinating that we'll see a little bit later in this presentation as well. So here is a Menopachi's picture of a buttonholed uh, uh, lens in an adult. And you can see there's just a little bit of opacity of the anterior capsule, but no real fibrosis. He is extremely meticulous in scraping and polishing lens epithelial cells off the anterior capsule flap, as well as doing the posterior capsulorexis. And you can see how clear and beautiful that looks. <clears throat> 
Well, is it safe to do this? Menapachi is added to the literature immeasurably, and I actually went to study with him in order to learn this technique some years ago. And uh, he has uh, um, paired eye studies of uh, with and without capsulorexis, with and without optic capture, and so on. And in fact, uh, there's no increase in CME, there's no increase in intraocular pressure, and uh, no increase in RD. In fact, I'm thinking that when we get to enough numbers, we're going to see a much lower rate of, eye, of, of retinal detachment because we're stabilizing the vitreous base and preserving the hyaloid for life. <clears throat> now here's an example of one that went awry in one of my early series and I was hoping, sorry, I was hoping to um, to use the same lens that he uses, which was a Hoya lens, and I was told that that would be the case, and perhaps I was just a little chicken on the size of my posterior capsulorexis. At any rate, it turned out to be rather a stiff lens. Uh, he chooses a lens that has a very 90 degree optic haptic junction, because that's the only place that our material, our lens material, is going to touch lens epithelial cells, which is what creates the transformation of these cells to fibroblasts and, uh, and uh, myoblasts. And so, uh, here I'm trying to optic capture, and um, I realize at some point that as I'm trying to get the uh, proximal pole captured that I have broken the posterior capsule here. Uh, and so I no longer have a continuous capsule, you'll see after a bit here. And so thinking quickly, all I had to do was forward capture, forward of the anterior capsulorexis, because I don't have a stable lens if it's in the bag, but I don't have an intact and reliable posterior capsule. And there's always the chance of subluxation later. Uh, and so here I'm sort of digging underneath, cantilevering over the edge of the anterior rexus in order to bring that uh, pole up out of the bag, and then uh, bringing the other pole up out of the bag uh, into, onto the surface of the anterior capsular rexus so that the haptics are still in the bag, but now the optic is reverse captured forward of the anterior capsular rexus. And this is a technique, by the way, that can be used if, uh, say, you put in a one-piece lens in the bag and then suddenly on removing OVD or something, you break the capsule, you can uh, reverse optic capture rather than have to exchange a lens in the middle of things. And I've added tree essence just to be sure that no vitreous prolapsed, and that's always a good idea whenever you're at risk for that. And there was none, and this patient did just as beautifully, as far as I could tell, as if I had actually managed the procedure of putting it posterior. So we have two backdoor outs in case of complication, and that's one of the beauties of this technique. Now, pediatric uh, buttonhole avoids vitrectomy, and I have six years' experience, as I said, with small numbers, but I got Abbe Vasavada, who sees tons of pediatric cataracts, to please, please try the buttonhole technique because he had been involved in the uh, aphakia, pediatric aphakia study and, um, uh, and finally because of his, particularly because he had a femtolaser and I'll show you that, he decided to do a series and when I saw him last as a personal communication last asterisk, he had done 50 and he said they were the best eyes that he had seen in all the series that he had done. Now, let's get to that bag and the lens. And so the typical thing, of course, is that we put our lens in the bag, right, with an anterior capsulorexis and an intact posterior capsule. But Marie Tassignon designed a lens that doesn't actually have haptics. The haptic is simply a collar button. So there's two, like, parts of your, the haptic is kind of a base for the optic with a collar button around so that the two edges of the capsulorexis, the anterior and posterior, fit right into that collar button. So that's why she calls it the bag in the bag in the lens rather than the lens in the bag. And she has some startlingly wonderful outcomes. The only thing is it must be perfectly centered because centration depends entirely not on the zonules or on the bag itself, but on the centration of the two capsulorexes. And it must be perfectly centered. And they're not FDA approved. But look at her data. Between 1999 and 2006, uh, and this hasn't caught on like wildfire, I think mainly because it's so technically difficult to do. <laughs> Um, uh, she did uh, 300 eyes, and they included babies and children and uveitis and diabetes and all the worst cases, and her PCC closure rate, 0%. Okay. Not only that, but on pathology, you can see the uh, cells. These are the lens epithelial cells on the capsule uh, with a regular lens in the bag. And look at what the capsule looks like uh, for the bag and the lens. It's devoid of these transformed fibrotic cells. 
and look at these post-op results. Now Liliana has seen some of these eyes uh, post-operatively and seen that they do often have a summering's ring that remains sequestered out in the equator and really kind of shocked uh, Marie Jose because she wasn't seeing them when you dilate the pupil. And But the point is that they're sequestered uh, and don't have a, and that antigenic material which normally leaches out of our normal in the bag technique you know to cause inflammation it doesn't happen because it's sequestered and it's uh, that was another piece of my thought about SPCC which we'll get to in a moment now remember we think it's normal and great when people see 2020 and they've got you know this white fibrotic thing and then this little hole that we've made for you know with the YAG laser and they can see out 2020 but that's not physiologic this is physiologic Okay, this is what, what our eyes are meant to look like. And uh, the sooner we recognize that, I think, the better. Well, in my opinion, neither the bag in the lens uh, nor the uh, posterior optic buttonhole uh, takes care of every problem. And I bet anyone here who's uh, clinically involved has seen bag lens subluxations, which is becoming more and more of an epidemic. And we know one thing is in common of all bag lens subluxations, although most have pseudoxfoliation, some have either surgical trauma or true trauma, uh, non-iatrogenic, they all have one thing in common, and that is an intact anterior capsulorexis, and theoretically some degree of phimosis. Uh, and uh, before, of course, the capsulorexis, which was one of the best things since sliced bread for making phaco practical, we had tons of lens subluxations, but no bad lens subluxations. And not very many people who have pseudoexfoliation and don't have cataract surgery come in with spontaneous subluxations of their cataracts. That's that's rare as hen's teeth, right? But bag lens subluxation isn't. And so I came to a realization about eight years ago uh, that um, there was a better way to do this and um, rather than put the lens in the bag. And uh, I guess I was a little ahead of myself here. Of course, uh, we don't really know if something's going to work for eight to ten years, which is the average time from surgery to bag lens subluxation. I don't have great data, though I did large numbers of cases. I was tri strictly a clinic clinician and didn't have good data and no randomized trials. But my experience told me that the right thing to do is to put it in the sulcus. So let me show you this video. Are you seeing them well enough with the light the way it is? Everything okay with that? Okay. Um, so you can see the pincushion effect of this very uh, loose bag trying to make the hole uh, in the anterior capsule to initiate the capsulorexis. And we finally get that done. You can use uh, crossed blades if necessary in order to get it done if it's really, really tough. Um, <clears throat> but it wasn't necessary. Uh, and we really don't have any good system to judge, you know, to really quantify the amount of zonular laxity in cases. I don't know of any article that's really done well with that. There was one fair recently with a proposal but there was a lot of criticism about it um, and so you just have your own feel for this right and if you've got a pin cushion effect and you can see the bag kind of move with me a little as I get around and probably the reason we're seeing so many bag lens subluxations now is we're getting so good at surgery that despite very diffuse and significant zonular laxity we're managing to get these cases done in an uncomplicated manner and here I'm making no big movements to try to uh, maneuver the lens you know to free the lens or spin it and I'm doing multi-directional hydrodissection, another thing that I recommend in these loose zonule cases. And of course, in the Mayaki lab, you know, they've shown us all the terrible things we can do to zonules from the back, you know, particularly with rotation and so on. And your lab is just the greatest for, for adding to the literature on these subjects. So uh, here, um, I'm going to go ahead and do my uh, regular FACO. And even though it hasn't spun, I always do, I haven't sculpted in a millimeter in years, uh, a, a vertical chop, which is really very friendly. You can see the bag waft all around in the back there. And uh, that was kind of a posterior polar as well. You can see the attachments around that area, but it did polish off nicely. Uh, and I always support the chamber coming in or out with irrigation, with irrigation through the side port, a kind of a poor man's chamber maintainer, because I don't want chambers to collapse. And here you can see I'm very gently delivering the cortex. You don't want to just strip the cortex out or you'll see equator. And if at any point I can't get it free and I start to see the equator, then I'll back off and I'll put uh, capsular uh, retention, capsular expansion rings uh, in order to uh, perform the, uh, the removal of the cortex. But here I am successful and little by little. And I think it's really important also in these cases that you be start subincisionally and then be very uh, methodical about 
about every clock hour. I like to go one direction, then come back sub-incisional and go the other, supporting the chamber. And now I'm going to put a CTR, and we want to just gently lay that in to the periphery and feel the proprioception of not putting any pressure on that. That's a whole nother lecture. Uh, or we could uh, put something through the, the, the uh, leading eyelet to not put pressure. Now I'm checking that I have a small enough anterior capsular rexus because I'm intentionally, now that I put a CTR in the bag, going to put a three-piece lens in the sulcus and optic capture. Uh, through the anterior capsular rexus. And my theory uh, was and is that basically the lens is supporting the bag, the bag is supporting the lens, and more importantly, the optic uh, is a stent to prevent phimosis of the anterior capsule. So that uh, here you'll see, and it's a little more difficult in these cases because you can't just push. Sometimes it even needs a bimanual technique because these zonules are so lax, you know, uh, that it can be a little difficult. And you want to get, you don't want to leave a lot of OVD in the bag because you have an intact posterior capsule here. But I've uh, successfully optic captured. And I'll show you the pictures afterwards and what they typically look like. Uh, uh, after uh, I show you uh, uh, in this video, uh, I will come out as an hour. That's okay with everybody, I assume. Uh, I'll be showing you a more a zonular uh, loss case here in this particular video. And, um, and we come out with a result that is incredibly stable. I think if you're good, if you're in the clinical field, you recognize. And here's, of course, uh, one with missing zonules. So in this case, we're definitely going to use. Uh, after completing that, we're going to place uh, um, uh, capsule suspension hooks. I don't like to use uh, the. Um, uh, iris hooks because they're not properly polished and they put all the pressure in one place. These are the Yamaguchi ones, which are kind of like a hammerhead shark. And here you can see I've taken any pressure off by having a uh, suture that I can pull. So I can pull it around the equator without any pressure on the equator. And uh, here we... Um, uh, this is now another case, a post vitrectomy case, and it just shows the optic capture anteriorly so much better. Uh, I voice this over a little more contemporaneously, but you can see how easily that is. So here's the fellow eye of a patient with the standard bag in the lens with a CTR, and we have to go do anterior capsule relaxing incisions uh, with the AG laser in order to hopefully prevent phimosis. And who know? And here is what the eye looks like after optic capture. The fellow eye with that that very one with those loose zonules that you saw, and this is what we're trying to prevent. And you'll be amazed if you do this procedure uh, that you'll see. No pseudophagodinesis in the eye where you succeed and put the lens in the bag and have a nice CTR. You know, if they're loose, you're going to see this little bit of shimmer. Uh, and if it's in the sulcus optic captured, solid, absolutely solid with no phimosis. So I did that for a number of years and was very happy with that. And so here you can see the phimosis of the fellow eye, and maybe not, I should move this over so you can see the whole thing, but basically you can see how beautiful this looks. Um, uh, when it's optic captured. Now because of that experience and another experience, this was a paintball injury case uh, from long ago and I'm just going to speed it up a tiny bit because I take forever getting the lens in because I'm very cautious. Uh, this was a paintball injury with an iridodialysis and a traumatic iridoplegia and actually had an open posterior capsule from the trauma. And after we got everything cleaned up, I decided in putting this implant in that I could use that fibrotic posterior capsular opening that was there from the trauma as well as my perfect anterior capsular rexus. And in this case I decided I wasn't so comfortable just leaving it in the bag because of the fact that there was, was some zonular compromise and I wasn't going to sew the bag to the wall of the eye. Uh, and so I thought that if I capture both through the anterior capsular rexus and through that posterior opening uh, that this would lead to a nice stable implant and you'll see that in fact it does and I followed this patient for this is probably 10 years ago uh, and uh, he did very very well um, you'll see uh, I'll just uh, speed up through here just a little bit but uh, basically uh, we've got the whole thing in now and we're going to uh, in the sulcus and we're going to optic capture uh, both through the posterior fibrotic opening as well as the anterior capsule. And um, I won't bore you with uh, every little maneuver, I suppose. Um, 
Well, then again, maybe I will. <laughs> At any rate, uh, you can see that it takes a little bit of force in this case because it wasn't an ideal posterior opening, but you can count on the fact, and this is a very good teaching video because of the fact that when you have fibrotic capsule from old openings, you can count on them being very, very strong, and you can use them for optic capture when you have subluxated lenses rather than have to sew <coughs> the wall of the eye or do large vitrectomies. So uh, that's how I managed this case. And between thinking about stopping bag lens subluxations, stopping having to do anterior vitrectomies in children, stopping needing to rupture the anterior hyloid in routine cases 20 to 30 percent of the time with secondary cataract, I came up with the concept of a routine procedure that would address all of these issues. And basically, we have a 5 millimeter anterior capsulorexis. We remove the bag contents as usual. We may or may not need to vacuum or polish the anterior capsules. Uh, and that remains to be seen in some of the research we'll be doing. Uh, Menopachi doesn't think so with this technique, I've asked him. Um, and then we have our posterior capsulorexis with the intact hyloid because of forming burger space. Sulcus implantation then of a three piece lens. And after we sulcus implant, then we optic capture through both the anterior and the posterior rexus. Now, I don't think anyone has ever suggested that. That is my unique idea and the, for a routine procedure. And the concept is that we both stent the anterior capsule from the point of view of phimosis, and we prevent PCO in every case, and we sequester, like the bag in the lens, all lens epithelial cells from touching the optic, except right at the haptic optic junctions, uh, minutely. And we sequester all the antigenic material, uh, and uh, I suspect that in addition, and this is not my case because I came up with this just after I retired actually um, uh, from patient care, but uh, my friend Kathleen McCabe uh, did this. Uh, and um, this was actually her first PCCC, so it's a little bit small that she had made, and she's putting the lens in the, in the sulcus, and you can see her optic capture. Uh, and I think that an extra bonus of all of this uh, is going to be that there's just a chance that we might see accommodation. If we're sulcus implanted and we have a unit which still keeps all of its zonular attachments together, including the posterior zonules, and we have a capsule that does not become fibrotic or ever need to be lasered, might that not move with the right lens design? And that's what I'll be working on in the future here also uh, with um, uh, Dan uh, Goldberg, who, uh, if you haven't read his his studies of uh, expanding Helmholtz's theory of accommodation, you really should. He has probably the seminal article in JCRS on that. So here she has rather handily in her first case of PCCC uh, by by optic captured. And this patient was a macular degeneration patient that she chose for her first patient. You know, I mean, just a dry AMD. So anyway, he's doing great, you know, but uh, nothing uh, to write home about. Uh, more uh, amazing to me, I gave this lecture uh, as the Wolf Lecture at University of Iowa about four months ago, and uh, Tom Oding decided he had a patient who was a monocular eight-year-old JRA patient who had had all kinds of problems with all sorts of phimosis and uh, inflammation after her first un uneventful cataract surgery in her first eye, and he decided to use my bicapsulotomy technique, sulcus bicapsulotomy, and at four months, to six months now. I, I'm not sure about the six-month follow-up because she's lost in retina land, according to her, him. Uh, however, uh, he said it was a perfectly clear opening, and he has made two more attempts. But the problem is that it's rather technically challenging, and there are very few people who want to do a manual posterior capsulorexis. And so the learning curve and how to make this accessible to the average anterior segment surgeon is where I'm at right now and why we're here in the lab that we're going to do with Minosis today. And I want to explain that a little bit. So I think I'm pretty much on time here. So to take a breath then, um, one of the possibilities is to use the femto laser. And I, uh, I actually had some experience with uh, flax, or however you want to call it these days, uh, before retiring because I saw Burkhardt Dick make a posterior capsulorexis in a child, off-label, of course, fooling the machine as to what all the gates and parameters were. And that's what I wanted to do. But unfortunately, the FDA decided to change their language of art so that all of the femto lasers are labeled as contraindicated under age 22. 
try to get that, that through an IRB, yeah. And um, also in court would be rather untenable, even though there's no evidence that it's bad. There's just no indication, and they've decided to use the word contraindicated for that. Uh, and uh, uh, my OR wouldn't let me put, my surgery center didn't want me to put it in the OR because of the logistics of using, you know, the ORs, the two ORs that we had, which is required if you're going to sterile redock under general anesthesia and uh, use this technique. But it's interesting that without going back to optic capture in adults, he, in his first series, was able to see in 68% of people right after a routine flax when redocking, he could actually see the distinct posterior capsule and the anterior hyoid, and he was able to do a posterior capsulotomy with the femto laser in 68% of patients without rupturing the hyoid and with a perfect opening. And it's interesting that that flap wizened up out of the visual axis completely where you couldn't see it by day one post-op in every one of those patients, he said. Now here is Abe Vasavada making with the Lensex. Uh, Burkhart was working with the Catalyst, and this is the Lensex. And I was on the Surgeon's Advisory Committee for Catalyst, but I'm no longer, obviously, it's AMO. Uh, and uh, you can see that he's made a perfect posterior capsulorexis right here, which he chose to make smaller than I would. Uh, but anyhow, here's the anterior and the posterior capsule, and that's all he sent me. But it does, uh, it is quite possible to do it. Now, there are economic barriers to doing this routinely for everybody, right, with a femto laser, and only 68% could see that without, and if you want a posterior optic capture, then you have to undock and then go back in the eye and optic capture, which you'd have to do in children to do this, and it's doable. I thought perhaps we could have centers of excellence, pediatric ophthalmologists could be credentialed to do this procedure, and, you know, all the kids' uh, stuff would be, at least kids, would be done there, and that. Uh, is really a premium surgery to never ever need to have a YAG laser again for adults, you know, to just get your quick femto done, you know, afterwards. Uh, but um, uh, for the, all those reasons, it's not practical. Here comes the reason for our lab. And uh, the Minosis company has something called the Zepto Perfect uh, Precision Capsulotomy Maker, which has a soft, clear suction cup with a nitinol. Uh, uh, tubing inside of it and uh, it can fit through a 2.2 incision because of this rod that makes it go flat and then open up again inside the eye and they're in 510k uh, for uh, anterior capsulotomy and I went to them and said look we, we got to study this for posterior capsulotomy and the way it works is without a thermal effect it because it sucks onto the capsule and makes the capsule kind of um, kind of uh, curl up around it when this proprietary DC current is applied, it uh, explodes the water molecules in the membrane that causes this simultaneous, perfect, <coughs> continuous capsulotomy. And it turns out uh, that it's extremely strong. Uh, in paired eye cadaver studies, they found interest, oops, I'll go back to that just a second. Uh, they found interestingly uh, that um, uh, femto had the same strength as manual don't forget these cadaver eyes don't move, which is probably with, you know, the slight movements that we have with the, the even if it's a second to do a femtocapsulotomy, you know, it's not as strong in so many of the articles that we've seen. And uh, the, uh, the, this capsulotomy was significantly stronger than either manual or femto, probably because the edge curls over. And this is our ex vivo rabbit lab in California that I did with Minosis. This is me doing this surgery. And you can see we are just applying the suction and then the uh, uh, then, and you can see this perfect capsule of the anterior capsular flap. This is, of course, open sky in an ex vivo rabbit. And uh, you can see how it hyper stains. And that's really because uh, on SEM, you can see the edge just kind of curl over so that you're actually got a double edge that is continuous. Uh, and that's why it hyper stains like that and is stronger than any other uh, method. And here in this ex vivo eye, it was so lax and loose, it was really hard to make a tear in the posterior capsule. Of course, in the human, you saw the posterior capsule didn't move when I did that, but it was a challenge just to get a little hole in that posterior capsule. And then here I am putting OVD, and nobody really knew till now even is there a burger space and a rabbit or what it's like. We're going to find out a lot more at 2 o'clock uh, today because we're going to be working to try to use this posterior, uh, to make a posterior capsulotomy and look at the pathology of it. Um, with uh, rabbits that will be sacrificed right after the study. So here, uh, 
uh, the anterior capsule is done. I've made the hole in the posterior capsule. I've uh, inflated burger space with OVD, and now I'm putting the uh, device into the capsule. And of course, it's a tad big for this little rabbit eye, but it's working. And uh, and I let it go um, round. And then we're going to apply the suction like we did before. And this is the anterior capsule right over here. And what we ended up doing was actually getting an almost perfect capsular, posterior capsularexis, uh, which you'll see here in a moment, probably because of the angle sub, you know, where, where I was used to being subincisional, even though I was open sky, I might have had a slight uh, angle. So we have a nice PCCC. There was a tiny little tag uh, subincisionally that you'll see that I have to pull around. Uh, and then it's strong enough to act, and that completed it. Uh, and it's strong enough to do posterior optic capture, even though this is kind of a big lens for this little eye. And uh, you can see I'm putting it in the bag and able to capture it through the posterior capsularexis into burger space without vitreous presenting or breaking that posterior capsule. And you can see it here, okay? that we did manage to capture it. So that's the first time anyone ever tried that. For further investigation, today we'll be headed to try to uh, elucidate how we can do this some more so that we can put something that they're saying might be $100 a case. And keep in mind that if we opt to capture, we're saving socialized medicine tons of money for YAG lasers. I mean, millions, billions of dollars. Um, and uh, then I hope to do a subsequent live rabbit study where I compare the standard pediatric case uh, with anterior vitrectomy to standard buttonhole to my concept of SBCCC. And I want to see what happens to fibrosis, which is a good animal model for that, though of course we can only infer what might happen as far as bag lens subluxation, and we can't study accommodation in this model. So, disadvantages, there's a learning curve, manual, femto laser, zepto, there's something out there called a capsule laser that's being worked on that might do the job, and newer technologies may make this technique more at, at, at hand for people. Um, lens exchange may require a pars plane of vitrectomy. Uh, hopefully, we won't be exchanging many lenses in the future. There are femto technologies where we can write different um, uh, uh, refractive indexes into the cornea and the lens. Lens, uh, where we can, without healing response, without deepithelialization, right now we have the ability, and you would still have the ability to piggyback, okay, uh, a lens uh, here because we have have it back, okay. So I'm hopeful that we could piggyback. That would be another experience, uh, another experiment potentially. Um, but I would think the way to exchange a lens would be to anterior irrigation, posterior approach for pars plane and do a small anterior vitrectomy, poke the lens forward, and then from above put viscoelastic to cover the area, and then you could exchange the lens. But that would be a small disadvantage. Um, elimination, of course, there's always LASIK. Elimination of fee-for-service income, uh, that's uh, beyond my scope of worrying about that and in fact might be a huge advantage economically and imagine in the third world where people just manage to get one surgery but can go blind functionally blind again from PCO and may not be able to get that. Advantages, zero visual access op uh, uh, opacification, I have no doubt. Uh, it may eliminate bag lens subluxation, I have hope. Uh, permit toric lens use, if we have, especially if we have a one-piece, uh, a three-piece uh, toric lens, which we don't currently have. We can only optic uh, buttonhole a one-piece lens. We wouldn't want to put that in the sulcus for a bicapsulotomy capture. Uh, but it would permit that with proper lens design. And I think this technique, if it proves to be useful, may well drive lens design, especially towards something that might accommodate. We'll decrease dysphotopsia because there's no reason on earth to have a square edge anymore, which is just to retard PCO, uh, which increases is dysphotopsia. We'll have quieter eyes since, lens, uh, eyes since lens proteins are sequestered, and perhaps we'll decrease consecutive uh, glaucoma in pediatric cases. We will have an intact hyloid for life. You won't have to have people coming in complaining of their floaters after YAG lasers. You won't have CME or increase in RD. And uh, also, it's better vision. Even if you have a 20-20 eye, it's been shown that stray light is significant from the intact, clear, polished posterior capsule compared to no posterior capsule. Manapachi has some nice literature on that as well. So it will be 
clearer, better vision from the get-go and forever. Um, space for secondary refractive piggyback, I hope, and um, uh, then uh, maybe we'll have accommodation. So those are the holy grails. Uh, this uh, gets my juices flowing and hopefully uh, others will as well and uh, we'll see if maybe there could be a new future that would be different from the last 20 to 30 years that Kelman offered us in a big leap. There has no, been no big leap for a very long time. And uh, these are the people who I thank very much for their encouragement and help and knowledge and uh, building my thoughts and uh, I did just write uh, a an article in the August iWorld and hope to publish more hope to publish the case with Tom Oding uh, that he's done and uh, thank you very much for your attention and for showing up at such short notice yes Right. Well, I, I, I think that we're collapsing the capsules. I, I mean, time will tell. And I guess the only real concern would be if the summering's ring would grow so thick that it might intrude upon the haptics in the sulcus and push it forward. I, I think that's, you know, I mean, that's why I didn't tell Tom Oding to do this on a monocular eight-year-old JRA, but he did. That's why I want this rabbit lab to kind of see what's going to happen to these eyes. And the same, thank you for mentioning that. I should put a slide, yeah. Manapachi studied this very well for posterior optic capture. Not I, Nobody studied it for bias, capsulotomy capture. Uh, but for posterior optic capture, it doesn't become even significant at all till you're up above 30 diopters and then maybe a quarter of a diopter because the posterior capsule is so flexible that it's basically the haptics in the bag that are controlling uh, the, uh, uh, the power. And when you put it in the sulcus, it's the anterior capsule is so unflexible that it basically keeps it in the bag. So they're pretty similar, and so I'm thinking that we would end up at the bag plane with bicapsulotomy, but there's no data, needless to say. Right. Yes. Well, I haven't seen it happen. It hasn't happened to me. It didn't happen to Menapachi in over five or 6,000 cases uh, that he's, I mean, I know he did 5,000 cases as of some time back. Uh, and in his first 150 that he wrote about in that article, it didn't happen. Uh, so the, the point is that we're putting it on top of a bed of OVD, which is delimited by Weigert's ligament. So if you had totally ruptured the hyloid, yes, that's possible, but don't forget, you need to put the haptics in the bag or somewhere else. If you put the haptics through the posterior capsulorexis, it's going to drop, okay? Uh, but the optic won't. So um, there's some technique to it, no question about it. Um, and, uh, and so that's why you want to carefully inject, you know, you're not going to be shooting stuff with a tunnel assist, you know, into these, into these eyes with open posterior capsules. But it's extremely doable because after you get the rexus done, if you want it in the bag, then you just blow up the bag with OVD and it's very obvious where your haptic is going. Uh, and as soon as that leading haptic goes in the bag, you're pretty much safe. Yes? Good question about a post vitrectomize. The question is, why not? Now, uh, you wouldn't have to do all that business with, you wouldn't put uh, OVD into the posterior segment because it would just fall down. There's no way to, to complete it. But you can certainly do a PCCC, and that would be the way to center a lens uh, in a vitrectomized eye that still had zonules, but no anterior capsule. Good question, good thinking. Yes? Some double cross something technique, and I was like, what? 
Uh, so what that's about, when you have a really loose zonia, it's a truly subluxated cataract uh, or whatever, you can do a cross swords technique. So what you're doing is you're just taking a, a tiny little blade from either side and, and, and yeah, uh, just or to anything really, and, uh, and you just sort of trap it between them. And that way you're not, you're not depending on, on movement of zonules. You're, you're, you're fixing it with the, you know, with the uh, oppositional forces of your two instruments. So it's a way to deal with a really recalcitrant capsule for opening it. Yeah. Well, the, 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 yeah, the problem is that you don't know if there's any space at all between the hyloid and the capsule. So you will at some point rupture your hyloid, and you'd have no way to know it, really, until you see vitreous coming. <laughs> so if you're lucky enough to see it, yeah. So, um, so that's why you just don't want anything that goes down. So all you, it's just a 30-gauge bevel-up needle. And that way you can kind of snag it a little and lift it up slightly and then just uh, give it a little zits. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day and hope our lab goes well. Thank you.